Better than we know. <laughs> Better than we think. Well, this is going to be fun this morning because up until like five minutes ago, I didn't know what I was going to preach on. So, <laughs> how many life like gets busy sometimes? Anybody get no. life gets busy, and I mean, summer hits, and then busy season started, and then we had a baby, and then we moved, and then I mean, just. Like, one thing after another, and like, I just, to be honest with you guys, I haven't picked up my Bible in like, other than Sunday mornings for the last two weeks, so just real, real transparency, and, and um, no, no, no condemnation, and thank God that now we're learning that Jesus is the Word, and it's not about, you know, spending time with the Word is not necessarily spending time reading your Bible, although that can be part of it. But spending time with the Word is just spending time with Jesus. And you can spend time with Jesus no matter what you're doing. And, and driving or working or whatever it is. I mean, I, I thank God for, for um, the gift of tongues. Because when we, when we pray in the Spirit, it's, it's direct communion with the Father. It's direct communion with the Word. And it doesn't require me to have to think. I can just pray in the Spirit. And it's like I can relax knowing it's all taken care of. Because... Yep, just be, it's just, Father, you said that when I pray in the Spirit, I'm praying out mysteries, and I'm praying out just the things that I need, that you know that our family needs, and, and that you're giving me revelation, and and so thank God for that. But um, So this morning, we're going to start in James chapter 1. It's going to be interesting, and we're kind of going along just kind of this vein that we're that we've been in for the last few weeks, and just almost relearning who God is and, and relearning um, how good He is and just the way that He thinks towards us and the thoughts that He has towards us. And, and during praise and worship, God, God gave me a few verses, but I think we'll start here. So He says in James chapter 1, in verse 6, or verse 5, it says, But if any of you lacks wisdom, anybody lack wisdom? No, oh, okay, well, <laughs> in the wrong building, I guess. I guess I'm the only one. <laughs> yeah, um, I'll be the first to pray for wisdom, then I'll pray for you guys, <laughs> for humility. If any of you lacks wisdom, <laughs> let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But he must ask in faith, Without doubting, for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For that man not, ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. And so during, during praise and worship, um, I just, I don't even know if it was the Father or just a thought, but it's, you know, the title of my message is, A Double-Minded God? Question mark. And it's interesting because if you read the Bible, any time that it talks about, well, I won't say any time, but when, when, it, when the scriptures say something like, you know, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways, or a really good example would be the verse that says, a man who doesn't take care of his family is worse than an infidel. I think it's in Timothy. Is that, but it says, a man who doesn't take care of his family is worse than an unbeliever or a, an infidel. I don't, I don't know what the Greek word there is exactly, but... One, one, one of our teachers in Bible school, Greg Moore, he told the story about, um, you know, when they, when they were pastoring. It seems like the Word of Faith preachers just struggle. I don't know why. In the beginning, most of them, <laughs> financially. <laughs> I think it's the thing that you can't work when you preach, and that was kind of the, for a long time, it was a mindset that if you were going to be a pastor, you could only be a pastor, and that was, and then you just believe God, and, and a lot of times the family struggled, and thank God God was still merciful and gracious towards them, but... Anyway, so he was, they were, the shelves were bare, you know, typical word of faith story, and they didn't have any food, and, and they, he was believing God for, to take care of his family. And so he went to a, a special service with, I, I remember who was speaking, it was a lady that was speaking, and during, during the service at some point, she probably was praying for people, but she looked at Greg, and she said, Greg, a man who doesn't take care of his family is worse than an infidel. Looked him straight in the eyes, and, and of course, instant condemnation, it's like, but I'm trusting you, God. And she said, no, you didn't hear me. She said, this is what the Father is saying to you. I'm the Father, and I'm not an infidel. So it was the Father directly speaking to, to Greg. He said, as the Father, I take care of my children. 
And it was just a revelation that, that propelled him into a place of, of believing the Father. And, you know, of course, within a couple of days, the shells were full. And, you know. But it was taking a scripture that, that, that we could use to bring condemnation to people because we read it as towards ourselves, but the scriptures all point to Jesus, right? So if it says a man who doesn't take care of his family, or a father who doesn't take care of his family is worse than an infidel, and God is our father, then you can take that scripture and say, okay, God is my father, and he takes care of his children because he's not an infidel. We know God is not an infidel, right? So when we look at James, it says that a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. We can say, you know what, if a double-minded man is unstable in his way, God is, Jesus was a man, and he wasn't double-minded, and he's the full representation of the Father. So, where am I going with that? Well, the majority of the church today believes that God is a double-minded God. Because we preach, not we, the message that's being preached on the whole, the gospel that most people are believing, is the gospel that says, when you turn to God, then he'll turn towards you. Right, right with the chairs, where it was, God had his, God was turned, and then when we turn towards God, God turns towards us and blesses us. When the reality is, is God always has been towards us from the foundation of the world. And then we looked at Romans chapter, was it Romans chapter 5, where it says that, that in his forbearance, God looked over the sins of the past, not punishing anyone for them, right? Which means, if you, if you understand what that verse means, it means that any time the Old Testament says that God punished a people, a nation, a person for their sin, right? That they didn't have a full revelation of who the Father is because now we have the New Testament, that's the full revelation. So God has never punished anyone for their sin because Jesus was crucified from when? The foundation of the world. So God, God looked at Jesus, right, and said, I, I count you, I, or I, I count the world. And it wasn't even like God needed to count the world from the cross, because the cross is not for God. The cross is for us, right? Absolutely. It's not like Jesus didn't come to appease the Father. He came to show us, it, to demonstrate to us love. That's what the cross is about. And, but yet the gospel today is, you know, Jesus came to, to step in between you and the Father because the Father's angry. And, and now, you know, when you're saved, then Jesus becomes your, your mediator. And he jumps in between God the Father right before he throws a thunder lightning bolt at you and, and zaps you just like Zeus. And, and, you know, the blood, the blood. Look at my hands. Look at my side. And he saves us from himself, like we've said. You know, it's logically, what we believe doesn't even make sense, or what we have believed. The gospel, as we've known it, doesn't even make sense logically. And so, God is not double-minded in the sense of, and, and, and this goes even into to eschatology. I'm not going to get theological, but just end-time stuff where, you know, the Bible says that, that his mercy endures forever. Do you guys believe that? Do you believe that his mercy endures forever? So is it that his mercy endures forever, or is it that his mercy endures forever until it doesn't? Until God decides that he's had enough, and Jesus comes back, and he rescues those who have believed, and then everybody else is... No mercy, right? I mean, just, just, just to like think about these things logically. I know that you know we want to. It's, <laughs> it's like, well, what about this verse and what about that verse? Well, we have to look at the scripture because it, I understand that there's lots of scriptures that if you read them without understanding what they say, and or, or not even understanding, but if you read them without interpreting through love, then they can like. The book of Revelation can be a scary book if you don't understand that it's 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 a it's a dream, it's a vision. And understanding that Jesus 
isn't coming back or whatever, whenever, however. But it wasn't that he was coming back to hurt people. It's, it's a picture of what he did on the cross. It's a picture of his fiery judgment towards sin, which was our separation. Because he loved us so much, he came and he dealt with that, and he died away sin. And, and, it, and his, his judgment towards sin is forgiveness. Right? We, we look at, we think judgment, we hear judgment, and we... Well, Judgment, you know, God is going to judge this and judge that. And we think, oh, judgment's a bad word. It's a bad thing. No, judgment just means to make a decision. When a judge makes a judgment, it's just a decision. So when God judges the world, what does he say? Forgiven. That's the judgment. That's the judgment, is forgiven. I forgive them. It, it's just a, but then, the, and, and listen, um, let's go to Hebrews chapter 2. I had to like look some of these scriptures up during praise and worship because, like I said, I didn't have anything before. In Hebrews chapter 2, I mean, I did, obviously. I just, it was in there. But it says, um, in verse 14, it says, Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also took, partook of the same. So he became flesh and blood, he became a man, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. And listen to this, And he might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. So Jesus comes... And he sets us free from fear, and fear comes from death. Right? Yes. But, but here's the thing, when you start preaching the true gospel, you can't control people anymore. Because when you preach the true gospel, you preach a message that is, God loves you so much that he really sets you free. He, he, re he really sets you free. And, and he loves you so much that if you use your freedom to make stupid decisions, it's not going to change his love towards you. And it's not going to change his mercy and his grace towards you. And there's never going to be a time when you have to fear that the Father's going to be angry with you because of the way that you act. Right? Because he's not a double-minded man. Either, either he is love, light, and life, or he's not. Because he can't be both. A double-minded man is unstable. Like, if you look at that verse, what does it mean to be double-minded? It means to have two thoughts. Double-minded. Two thoughts. I have two thoughts. To come to God, and it's like, you, then you, like when you understand this stuff, and I'm still understanding, I'm still learning and growing, but it's like, as I begin to understand it, it's like, well, no wonder people can't, like, don't have a hard time receiving from God because it's, I ask for wisdom, Father, I need wisdom. Your word says if I ask you for wisdom in faith, you'll give me wisdom, Be right? Okay. But then I go, and it's like, God gives me wisdom, but then I mess up, and I think, okay, well, now, now I messed up, so now I need to repent and start over. Why? Because... In one mind, God is freely giving. In another mind, God is worried about what I'm doing. And what I'm doing affects how he's going to treat me. So really, it's God over here and God over there, and, and, and it's Jesus and the Father and the Father, and Jesus are somehow at odds with each other, and the Holy Spirit is in the middle, and he's, you know, I don't know, keeping them from, like, fighting each other. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it's silly when you say it out loud, but because when you think about it, you don't, you never like put it into words that way. But it's really, that is really kind of what 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 people think and believe. And so, when you remove the fear though of death, it's like now you can come to God, or and you just remove fear. Period. It's like now we can come to the Father in full faith. Yes. Right, knowing that if I ask Him for wisdom. He's going to give me wisdom. And if I do mess up, if I 
do make a bad decision or, or, or step into the flesh, let's put it that way. Is that, is that a good way to put it? Do you have a flesh moment? Anybody have flesh moments? I've had a few lately. If you do have a flesh moment, it doesn't change your standing with the Father. Right? And when you do have a flesh moment, you may experience wrath, but it's not the wrath of the Father, it's just the wrath of your decision. And God is there to rescue you from that. Why? Because He came to rescue you from wrath. But the wrath is never from the Father. It's never wrath, the wrath of God. It's never, right? Even though the Bible, like the scriptures that we have, say that, it's just translated wrong. And unfortunately, because we, there again, I'm like still studying and still growing, and, but, but unfortunately, over the years, the scriptures have been translated and retranslated, and then translated through lenses, and translated during times when there was oppression, and it was like, I mean, the King James Bible, when they translated the King James Bible, they, they were afraid of the king. So you're translating a Bible because the king wants to be able to read it. And you're talking about a king who's running the country, who wants to control people. You can't just like, if you start writing, well, people are free. And then the king reads that, it's off with your head, right? It's like, you know, um, what movie is it? Off with the head, Alice in Wonderland, <laughs> Right? So they translated it, and they just kind of tweaked it a little bit. Yeah, yeah, that is. Was it? Is that the? Yeah. So you have all these things, and 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 here's 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 the thing that we get to then, is that if we have to be careful how I say this because. If we place this, the Bible, Scripture, on a pedestal, where this is like the ultimate authority, that's when we get in trouble. Because this is important, because it helps us get to know the Word, right? But Jesus is the ultimate authority. Is it okay to say it that way? Still okay? You guys still love me? Right, you don't. I, I, I mean, we've been saying over the last few weeks. You don't have a relationship with a book. You have a relationship with the Father. You have a relationship with Jesus. Now, the book can help us know Him, and it can help us understand who He is when when read, read correctly and when understood correctly, and when we allow the Holy Spirit to to help us with that. You know, it's like Paul said, you need no man teach you because the anointing is your teacher. Well, who, who is the anointing? It's Jesus. Jesus is the anointed one. He is the anointing. He is, he is our teacher. And so it's not, you know, I'm, I would never, ever stand up and say, well, we're not going to read the Bible anymore because that would just be, like, dumb. Right? Because I do believe that this helps us to know him. And I do believe that when we understand and we can, when we read it correctly, we can get lots of revelation out of it. But let's keep the important thing the important thing, which is we have a relationship with Jesus. Yeah. Right? Yep. So, so we've been set free from the fear of death, which brings slavery. And then if you tie that with 1 Corinthians, or is it 2 Corinthians or 1 Corinthians? 15.56... First Corinthians fifteen fifty six. It says, "O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting?" This is Paul. Now he's actually quoting an Old Testament scripture, but he says, "O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting?" And then he says, "The sting of death is what? Sin. The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law." You know something that I think we. On Wednesday night, it was it was said. I think Paul or some or, or Bonnie, one of one of some or Andrew, somebody was saying the Bible says that what the law came by, or the law was given by who? Who gave the law? Who who gave the law? Moses. 
So who gave the law? Moses. So is it God's law? <laughs> but grace and truth came. It's like the law was given. Grace and truth came by Jesus. So it's like, you know, we could, uh, we're not going to go there, but, but the law was given by Moses, and, and then it says, so we're talking about being set free from the fear of death, right? But death, the sting of death is sin. So what happened on the cross? Sin's forgiven. So if sin is forgiven, then now you can kind of, you can kind of backtrack on how death has been destroyed. Because if sin is forgiven, death is no longer an issue. Right? And the strength of sin is the law. Well, what did Jesus come to do? He didn't come to abolish the law. He came to fulfill the law. And in fulfilling the law, what does that mean? It means that he showed us what it was all about in the first place. And it wasn't even, it's not like he came to show us what, the old, what Moses' law was about. He came to show us what the law of God looks like. Because the law of Moses and the law of God are two different things. If you've studied the scriptures, and there's like in the grace in the grace circles, there's this confusion going around right now about you know when God when Jesus came and he died in fulfilling the law, he took the law of Moses and then he puts that law of Moses in our hearts, right? And now we're able to keep the law of Moses because he put it in our hearts. And and you know it's like. It, to me, it's, it's silly. Sorry if you're watching on YouTube and that's what you believe. But, but it's like, just think about this. If that's true, then why did Jesus break the law of Moses like on a regular basis? Maybe that's, maybe that's news to some of you, but Jesus broke the law of Moses like on a regular basis. He healed on the Sabbath. He worked, worked on the Sabbath. He, you know, the, the woman caught in the act of adultery, right? Where was the man? But he didn't stone her. He broke the law. Over and over again, he, broke the, he touched lepers. He ate with sinners. So he broke the law of Moses. And yet you want to, you know, it's like you want to tell me that God put that law in our hearts. It's not the law of Moses that God put in our heart. He put the law of God in our heart, which is what? The law of liberty, the law of love. The law of freedom in Christ Jesus. So it's like, you know, I, I think I've used this example for, year, for years now, but it's like, are we really free or are we not? And, and the way that I look at it, it's like this. If you have, anybody ever have a parakeet or a cockatoo or whatever, like a bird? Anybody ever have a bird for a pet? Anybody? Okay, nobody, okay. Yeah, just, we had parakeets and we, we've had but anyway see if you have a pet bird right it lives in a cage so you have the cage that, that, that bird is now in captivity right and I'm now it's God and I'm a good I'm a good person so I take care of it and I feed it and you know make sure it has a good life but it's still in captivity it's, or it's still in a cage it still doesn't have its freedom now this is how most people view Freedom is, you know, me as a loving God, I say to the bird, you know what, you need more room, you need some space. So I take the bird, and I take it out of its cage, and I let it fly around the house. Right? So now, it's like, well, I gave you, I gave you freedom. Is the bird free? No, because it's still it's still in a place that it wasn't designed to be in the first place. Because where it's designed to be is outside. So it's like God comes and he sets us free from sin, so he takes us out of the little cage that we were in, and he just gives us a bigger cage. And now it's like you have more freedom, but if you mess up, if you, if you, you know, sin then you're going to be in trouble. So it's really not freedom, because real freedom is you have the freedom 
to be free. He's, you know, I forget where it's at in the, in, in the exact scripture, but it's, it was for freedom that he set you free. So it wasn't, it wasn't for, you know, it's like, it wasn't for, how would you say that? It wasn't for doing right things that he set you free. It wasn't for getting people saved that he set you free. It wasn't for preaching the gospel that he set you free. Like, those are good things, right? Should, should we preach the gospel? Should we? Absolutely. I mean, and, and when you understand what the gospel really is, you, you want to tell people. But it wasn't for those things that he set you free. It wasn't so that you would serve him. It wasn't so that you would take care of him. It was for freedom that he came and set you free. And it's like people, people hear that and they're like, oh my gosh, if you preach that, then people are going to go crazy and they're going to go and they're going to live and they're going to just... It's like... You know, it's like... I think on <clears throat> Wednesday night, just something that I've, I've kind of been seeing now is we don't, as a people, like we don't really understand what love is, first of all. And then we don't understand how powerful love really is. Because... We, it's like, if we really understood how powerful love is, you know, wrath and all these things wouldn't be an issue because it's like, to us, it's like, well, we need God's wrath because that will, that will keep people in line. Right? It's, it, come, I mean, you know, and then we preach, well, you know, Katrina was the judgment of God and... I mean, all these things. I mean, now it's now it's the the monkeypox, and it's being spread by you know homosexuals, and it's like it's God's judgment on them. And I mean, this is real stuff. I'm not even I'm not trying to make light of anything. This is like real stuff that's 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 now coming out, right? And it's like so we now need we need the sight of God that doesn't even exist, by the way, to. Bring people back into control through what? Death. Because if you don't live right, you're going to die. And then you'll go to hell. And so you preach a message, it's basically like repent, so that you can get to heaven. And then once you get them in, it's like, okay, well now that you're in the club, this, this is like the club rules. Yeah. And this is like the club you know, penance or whatever, the, the cost to be in the club. Ten, yeah, it's 10%. <laughs> That's 10%. <laughs> sorry, not sorry. <laughs> so it's really not freedom. And, it, and it's like, it's not love because... And, and I, it's like I prayed, you know, I'm, I'm asking God, it's like, Father, show me how powerful love really is. Because it's like, when, and, 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 and we get a picture, we get a, a glimpse of it, and I, and, I, and I think this is why Paul probably said, you know, the only thing I want to know is Christ and Him crucified. Because when you see Christ crucified, you see the full demonstration of love. And it's not, you know, we... For so many years, it's like, well, God loved us so much that he killed his own son instead of me. Right? I mean, see, when you say it like that, it sounds bad. So you don't say it like that. You say, well, Jesus, lo God loved us so much that he sent his only son, and he took my judgment. But the judgment came from God. Right? Instead of just saying, well, God is like Moloch, and he's a child abuser. Rather than looking at the cross and seeing a man who was God, God becoming a man, and then taking the full wrath of the law of sin, of, of, of that, which came from the do-it-myself, which was the sin nature, so it was... It was the wrath that really was from our fallen nature. And I won't, I won't even say our. It was Adam's fallen nature. It was just the, the sin nature. And you see now God 
as a man taking that upon himself, being beaten and bruised and, and crushed. And, you know, the Bible says that he was unrecognizable as a man. So to look at him on the cross, you, you, even The Passion is a great movie, and, you know, I cry every time I watch it. But to even watch that, it's not, it's not what Jesus looked like. You, you, if you would have looked at him on the cross, he looked like a piece of hamburger. He was so beaten and so bruised. And it, it wasn't even that he was so beaten and so bruised. It was that he became sin. He became the curse. He wasn't, see, and this is where we get it wrong. We think he was cursed by God. We esteemed him, what? Stricken, smitten of God. Yet, he was bruised for whose iniquities? The chastisement of whose peace? So it was... It wasn't God who cursed him. It was sin. It was, I don't want to say us, but it was, do, do, okay, so how does God treat that? I mean, here is love personified, and what do they do? They kill him. So what would justice say? I mean, if it was us, what would we say? Well, they deserve to die, right? I mean, can I just be real with you? I'm still not at the place where it's like if they took Isaiah and did that to him, that I wouldn't want full retribution and come and, you know, come and fire. And I mean, after all, he's God. If he wanted to, he could just say, done, everybody dies and he starts over. Burn the earth up and start over. Like, let's do this, right? But no. He takes all that and then he shows us love and love says, forgiven. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And then right before he dies, he cries out, teleos, finished. It is fin what is finished? Forgiveness. You know, it's like we, we, we said it was the law, that he fulfilled the law in that moment. No, it was forgiveness the whole world was now found in Christ forgiven. And God was, God was in Christ reconciling the world back to himself through love. It's like if, if, if they could just see how much I love them, if they could just see how much I love them, that's the Father's heart. If they just knew how much I love them, if they could just get a glimpse of love, if they could just see how much I love them, and it's, that's the way that he, like, it's not, it's, you know, he's God, so you can't say he lives. He exists. He exists to get people to see how much he loves them. And it's like, if his mercy really endures forever, and it's, it's not even, it's like, if he is love, then there's never going to come a time in history where he's going to stop trying to get you to see how much he loves him. And it was, so that's what love looks like. That's like a picture of love. And even in that, it's like, that doesn't like do it for me. It's like, Father, I need, and I think that's why Paul prayed in Ephesians chapter three. It's like that they would experience love. Yes. 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 That, they would, that they would gnosko, like they would intimately, one-on-one, -on -one, face to face, flesh to flesh, really know my love, the love of the Father. Because when we, when we really know the love of the Father, it will change us. And then, and then in changing us, it will change how we treat people, and it will change how we see people, and it will change, I believe it will change everything, right? But as long as we have this idea that there's somewhere, sometime, at, you know, some place, God's going to come in judgment, and then he's going to rescue us from all the terrible people, Right? Then, 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 you're an un, then you are a double-minded man. You are a double-minded man, unstable in all your ways, because in one sense you think that God is love, and in another sense you think that God is, is a judge, and he's coming with wrath, and, and thank God that he's going to come and finally deal with all the people who are just living wrong. And, and you forget that at one time that was you. And thank God he didn't come before you came to find him.
Right? Thank God that his mercy didn't end. Right? I mean, like, you're on your way to the church meeting <laughs> as a heathen. Right. And it's all of a sudden you hear the trumpet sound, and it's like Jesus appears, and the, the church is raptured out, and you're stuck there. And it's like, now what? I mean, thank God, you know, it's like, <laughs> sometimes, like, the things that we've believed over the years and the things that we've taught and the things that, we did, yeah, we didn't see it. We, and thank God that we, thank God that we at least te- taught that God is good, yeah. you know, we just didn't realize how good he is, like, how good he really is. You know, and, and can I, I'll throw this out there. Okay, I don't want you guys to like hate me, but <clears throat> like just just I would challenge people to show me a scripture, okay, where it says that once you die, that's the end. In context, okay. In context, because there I could I could take scriptures. I mean, the Bible says when when you die, then it's the judgment, but that's in Hebrews and it's talking about Jesus. So when he died, what did he do? He judged death. He judged sin. And what did he say? Death is life. Death is no more. Sin is forgiven. Judgment. Or the other one that they want to use is, is the parable on hell, which really isn't a parable on hell. It's a parable on Jews and Gentiles, the Lazarus and the rich man. So is it possible can I say it this way? And I'm not, I'm not saying that I've come to a conclusion. These are just things that I wrestle with. And when you start to see a father who is love, you're going to start wrestling with some of these things. And it's okay, because God is big enough to wrestle with you. But is it possible that maybe God is so good and so loving that even after death, he's still going to come after you? And that's maybe why David wrote, even in the place of death, even in death, there's nowhere that I can go. Even if I, even if I die, you are still there. I don't think David wrote that thinking, I'm going to be in a place of torment, and then in that place of torment, maybe God will visit me. Or his spirit will be there watching me torment. It's just, it's just a thought. Something for you guys to wrestle over, you know, Sorry. Not sorry. (laughs) What'd you say? (laughs) So, you know, in in 1 John 4, this is like, you know, this is a verse that we've used in the grace in the grace message, great verse. But it says in Verse 15, whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. We have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love, and the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. So, side note, Jesus said in John 15, I am the the true vine, you are the branches. If you abide in me, you will bear bear fruit, right? We all know that scripture. So what's the fruit that we bear when we're abiding in him? Right. So if we look at, if we take that scripture where it says, if you abide in me and I abide in you, you will bear fruit. And then we look at 1 John 4, verse 16. It says, the one who abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. Um, We've come to know by this love is perfected with us, or, or, or yeah, who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in Him. So, what's the fruit of abiding? It's love, right? Yeah. So, when we abide in love, the result will be that we love. Yeah. And I believe that if, if you, I shouldn't say believe, it would make sense then that all the fruit of the Spirit is about love yeah. and loving people. And then showing the Father's love through what? Through faithfulness, through gentleness, through self-control, through, through the fruit of the Spirit, where, or, 
yeah, the fruit of the Spirit, where it's now we're now we're showing people what love looks like. And it's not that we're showing people what our love looks like, right? Because it's it's not human love, it's the Father's love through us. Although it is, it's like, you know, it's not, it's like Arthur, you always use a joke, well, I love you with the love of, the, of God, which is a really Christian way of saying I don't like you, but the Bible says I have to love you. Oh, that's not even nice. <laughs> Sorry if anybody ever told you that. <laughs> but isn't it true, though? It's like, well, I love you. I mean, it's like, has anybody ever heard that? Don't raise your hand. But, you know, I love you with the love of God. It's like, well, why do you have to love me with the love of Can't you just love me with, like, because I'm, cause I'm kind of fun to be around? I don't know. You know? But, it, so it's, but, but it's like when you, like when you're abiding in love, like you just can't help but love people. It's your nature, right? Right. You, you, you're, you're waking up to the to yes. the oneness that you have with the Father. If you're one with the Father and you're one with love, then technically, I mean, technically, one plus one is two, so you are love. Because if you're one with love, and it's you know, I would never stand up and say it's it's you. Like, you can do this in your own strength, because that's where, I think that's where Adam, Adam and Eve messed up, was I can, I can get this without God. I can have this without God. I can have the life of God without God. If I know the good to do, and I know the e- and do the good, and I know the evil, and I don't do the evil, then I can have the life that God originally intended for me, but I don't need God anymore, because I can do it on myself. It's the same temptation, right? So we don't go out and we try to love people on our own, we, what is it? If you what? If if you what? Ab- ab- abide. What does that mean? If you spend time with him, if you're spending, if you're if you're getting to know him, if you abide with him, the fruit will be love. And I'm not saying that that there's not going to be times when you're going to ha- you, you're going to have to put some effort forth. I mean, one of the fruits of the spirit is self control, right? It's not a it's not a lackadaisical gospel, right? There, there are times when we have to live by faith, which means, you know, Paul told Timothy, fight the good fight of faith. What is the good fight of faith? The fight to stay in faith. The fight to stay in belief. The fight to, to combat the thought that maybe God is good over here and maybe he's not over here. Right? Because when we go through stuff, crap happens, and you go through crap, it's real easy to think, well, is God really good? Is it okay to be real? I mean, are you guys, are you, we're, we're, all, we're all humans here, right? I mean, it's... So, when we go through stuff, it's like, then the temptation comes to think, well, and it comes in two forms. It's either, well, either maybe God really isn't good. Now we know he is. So then we think, well, there's something wrong with me. There must be something wrong with me. Right? So then we go introvert or introspect and we start like self analyzing and we think, well, what did I do? You know, like, you, you know, for me it was, did I tithe? Did I give? Am I walking in love? Do I need to forgive somebody? Do I need to go to somebody and ask them to forgive me? You know, all the things, the keys, I don't know, there's probably like a hundred keys. Get them all in there right and turn them. And if you don't do the combination right, you start all over. It's actually more like a turn lock. You know, go forward, pass it twice, and then back. Oh, crap, didn't work. Try again, right? Love, tithe, forgiveness. Oh, no, nope, wrong. Tithe, love. <laughs> Rather than just resting in him and knowing... I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. He loved me so much that he, he made me righteous. He forgave me of all sin. And it, it wasn't even like I needed the forgiveness in my lifetime because he did it 
from the foundation of the world. Not, the, not, not need. He didn't do it in my lifetime. He did it from the foundation of the world. I was born into forgiveness. That's how I want to say that. I was born into forgiveness. I was born into innocence. And believing in the way that I... I just walk in it. I just walk in it. And the gospel isn't... If you don't believe, you're going to go to hell. The gospel is, if you don't believe, you're not going to experience the life that God has for you in the here and now. The world is in hell right now. I mean, I'm not saying that that is hell. I'm just saying, like, the world is experiencing hell. It's Because hell is just separation, right? It's just... And the problem is that they're, they're experiencing the separation and they're not separated. But the church is telling them that they are. Right? Even if it means you might have to like, smack a Christian. <laughs> Good, love. Good love, yes, of course. I love you, shut up. <laughs> but just... I mean, it's like to me, it's like this gospel is so beautiful that we can't help but grow. It's true. This is what they the want. real message. And it's like, especially the generation that's that, like, the the millennial, the younger generation, like they they are so hungry for something real, and they don't they don't want rules and regulations. I mean, that's obvious. And it's obvious that rules and regulations don't even work with them. So why don't we give them something more powerful than rules and regulations, which is love. And love is so powerful that it will steer and guide. Because if you really love your neighbor, you're not going to steal from them. If you really love your spouse, you're not going to cheat on them. Love is fulfilled in Jesus. The law is fulfilled in Jesus. And there again, I mean, those, those are good things, but it's not the law of Moses. It's the law of God. Jesus is here and he says, I am the, love, I am the law of God in person. And it's the law of love. It's the law of liberty. It's the law of freedom in Christ Jesus. And in that freedom, when you do have a flesh moment, you run to him instead of away from him. Because when you understand that he's the one that can save you, you want to run to the Savior. You don't want to run away from him, because if you run away from him, you you get away from, it's like, like, I'm running from the one that has the power to love me and heal me and to save me. Bless you guys. Have a good week. So maybe... The church has got it wrong for a little while, some of the church, in preaching that, you know, if you sin and mess up, God's angry at you. And then they wonder why the, the church is struggling and why people don't want to come to church. Well, y- you preach an abusive father. Nobody wants, an, nobody wants an abusive father. So he goes on in verse 17, it says, By this, love is perfected with us, so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in this world. And then we use that scripture, you know, is God sick right now? No, he's not. So are we in this world? You know, is God, does God have anxiety? No. Great. But it, actually, it's, it goes on to say, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves punishment, and the one who fears is not perfected in love. So what's he really saying? As he is, so are we. We can have confidence in the day of judgment. Why? Because Jesus came in judgment, and his judgment was forgiven. Love. So now there's no fear in love, because... Love says forgiven, and that's the judgment. But perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. And where does fear come from? 
the fear of death. The fear of punishment, the fear of, if I mess up, God's going to get me. Something's going to happen. If I don't tithe, the washer's going to break down. You know, he'll get it one way or another. Right. And now we're serving a double-minded God. And God is not double-minded. God is love, light, and love, light, and life. And when we come to him, that's all you're going to find is love, life, and light. His mercy really endures forever. He's really going to be chasing you down forever. For, because he loves you so much, he's unwilling to do without his children. Come on. Amen? All right, that's it. I'm trying to preach shorter. That was 45 minutes. There is a God. I just, I just proved it. Who loves you guys? <laughs> so, these is, don't forget. Um, we're not having. We're, we're now every other week on our on our Wednesday night Bible study. So not this week, but next week. Like, come out. Like this is. Usually we discuss and just like Wednesday night we just talked about what what I talked about wrath. We talked about wrath and we just talked about how good God is and and it just gives us an opportunity because. If I don't like talk to you guys, I don't know where you're at. I don't know if I'm just like running off without you and leaving you guys in the dust. And I don't ever want to do that. I want to be able to like have conversations with you. And like if you have questions, we can discuss them because I don't have all the answers. But when we talk and we discuss, like a lot of times the answer comes. Why? Because you need no man teach you because the anointing is the teacher. And when when two or three gather together, what the anointing's there. I mean, he's he's in, he's there anyways. But there's like it's like a manifest anointing where now there's a manifest teaching going on. It's like somebody says something and it just clicks in your mind. It's like, oh, that's the answer to the thing I had. And it doesn't have to come from the pastor because I'm not special. Just have a different calling, a different office. I, I stand in a different position. That's it. Amen? So you're blessed. I don't even need to pray over you. Just go and be blessed. Just go walk in your blessing and, and go, go and just ask God for revelation of the gospel. Amen? All right, love you guys.